Fáilte Rófa Lig, Maisha, Jake McShakish, O Forbert Sparrister. You're all very welcome. I'm uh, Jake McShakish from Forbert Sparrister. And we're doing a short-ish presentation here on the townlands of the parish of Shankle. Now, for you who aren't familiar with the townland of Shankle, the townland, or sorry, the civil parish of Shankle covers Belfast roughly from uh, Clock for Costilia or Greencastle right the way down uh, to the south where we have Lower Malone and then right up through the townland of Ballymurphy and all the way back round to the townland of Alta Garan. So I want to give a bit of uh, historical background to townlands. So the townlands that we're referring to are held within the bowl of the Belfast Hills on the western bank of the River Lagan. Uh, the civil parishes are one of the oldest divisions uh, that we have in Ireland. Townlands are, are even older. So I, I'd run through a quick presentation here on the historical uh, view of Ireland using maps. And the first thing that we, we notice is that the orientation of Ireland is seen by Britain. So Britain are looking at Ireland as an area for conquest. And we can see that this is their view of what Ireland is. So they, it's pretty accurate as maps go for that period. The plantation proper occurs in Ulster. And this was the view that um, the English had of Ulster. They were, of course, looking at it by this stage from the Peel, which was an area surrounding Dublin. So in 1590, just before the launch of the plantation of Ulster, this was the view that they were looking at. And you can make out all of the modern uh, provinces or all the modern counties and that and some subdivisions. The um, view that they had of Ireland was changing as they got to know more about the area that they were intending to invade or that they were intending to settle. So this is historical Ireland in the time of Celtic myths and legends. And what we see here are Hermann's half and Eber's half and Louis Corner. Lou uh, Lavada, the guy whose name we get uh, today in the modern month of Lunasa or August, occupied what is roughly the corner of Munster. Eber and Heramon were two of the main figures, sons of Milesius, who were said to be the people that settled Ireland. So we believe, uh, if we take the myths at their face value, that the Pretenni, who were Gaelic-speaking Celts, arrived in 600 BC in, in the northern half, and that the Lion and the Erin arrived in 400 BC and 200 BC. And it's the Erin who end up giving their name to the land, Erin as we know it today, or Ireland. As that, that developed into uh, the height of the Celtic uh, rule, or the Gaelic rule as it was to become, we can see that Ireland is divided into Lach Chin and Lach Moha. Uh, Khan is Khan of the Hundred Battles. He's an historical figure. And we do know that Khan of the Hundred Battles was among the barbarian tribes who sacked Rome uh, during the barbarian onslaughts on Rome. And one of the legends is that it was his people who carried back uh, a Welsh or French slave called Patrick, who became uh, the second bishop to the Irish, the first having been uh, Pelagius. Now we're into the, the, the realms of how the Romans looked at Ireland, and they called the, the place Hibernia. And Hibernia, you'll not be surprised to, to know, is called the land of eternal winter, or the land of winter. Uh, and we haven't shook that one off yet. So you can see the various tribes that are beginning to emerge. Um, we have the Criffin, the Dunum, uh, we have the Darini, the Venetini. And it's the Dorini that we're really interested in because they become the ancestors of the people who settled this area of the north. Again, Hibernia, and this is in the era 
of the legendary kings. That's when the, the Gaelic rule was firmly established. And you have the four main divisions at this stage are the Uli, uh, from whom we get Ullu's cheer or Ulster, the land of the Uli. Uh, we have the two main tribal divisions, who are the Dalfeta and the Dalreta. And then below that, we have the Connacht region, then Lyon and Erin. Erin will later become Munster. Uh, Lyon, of course, is Leinster, and Connacht is the modern Connacht. Moving forward into about circa 300 AD, these are all the royal sites and provinces. So the most important one for us is the site of Owen Macha, which sits just at, at, at modern Armagh, below the shores of Loch Erne. Uh, we have a group called Cola Uish, who are expelled out of Ireland to uh, Alba or Scotland, the white country. And they um, will return again and again throughout history as the Lords of the Isles and their descendants. Uh, here we have, uh, moving on again, the arrival of Christianity. Now, what we know for definite about Christianity is this map shows that there's the arrival of Patrick in 432. But Patrick actually, we don't know that much about him. He left a couple of, of, of pieces of writing, his confessio, and his breastplate. But what we do know for a fact from the written records is that uh, Pope Celestine the Great had actually appointed a guy called Pelagius to be the bishop to those Irish who believe in Christ. And that was in the year 431 before Patrick even allegedly arrived. So what we do know is that there was Christianity of some sort in Ireland even prior to the arrival of Patrick. Uh, again, this is the Ireland of the tribes, and we can see how it begins to break up. We have the Northern Eneal, and then uh, to the right, the Ullud, the Dalmargin, the Dalragin, the Dalfeatach, who were the, uh, the, the, the later descendants of the Northern Eneal. So there were a tribe in the south called the Southern Eneal. You can see them there uh, in the middle of the map to the north of Lyon, of Lyon and to the east of Connacht. And it's so southern Neil who established places like the Greenland of Eilioch, uh on the Donegal Derry border. Uh, they then move eastwards uh, into what is the area that we are most concerned with. Then we have the Golden Age. That's when the, the tribal areas were largely established and entrenched on the map of Ireland. Then we see the main kingdoms, which were there. So we have the, the kingdom of the Uliad, the kingdom of the Argelia, the kingdom of the Northern Eneal, the Southern Eneal, Connacht, Munster, and Lyon. They're the main divisions at that stage. We then move through into the arrival of the Vikings. And you can see from this map that uh, the Vikings arrive around the coast. They don't occupy huge swathes of territory. They are mainly uh, entering Ireland through the coastal areas and the river. And this is the areas of Viking influence. So we can see that there is no Viking influence at all in, in the north or in what we now call Ulster. But the Vikings are centered around the Dublins of Down, the towns of Dublin, Waxford, Waterford, Cork, and Dalkaish or Limerick, and they, they move into those territories and then they raid inland along the rivers. We then have the age of Brand Baru, and again, you can see that there are uh, different divisions that appear from time to time. The Northern Eneal are now differentiated by three um, brothers, allegedly the, the sons of uh, Con Kate Cahach, and they were Conal, Owen, and Donal. And from those three, we get Kenyal Connell, Kenyal Owen, and Kenyal Donnell, or Cheer Connell, Cheer Donnell, and Cheer Owen. And Owen is meant to be the one who cut his hand off and threw it ashore uh, on the shores of Loch Ney to claim the best territory in the centre. And that's where we get the ancient symbol for Ireland of the red hand. 
um, the Red Hand then is later uh, claimed by um, the descendants of the plantation people from the 1700s, and they incorporate that into what becomes their flag of the northeastern statelet. And there is High Ireland stood before the arrival of the Vikings, or before the arrival of the Normans. We can see that Dublin, Wexford, Waterford, and Limerick are still uh, Viking territories, but then we have the dynastic surnames. So anyone who, who claims to be um, pure Irish, which is a total nonsense, uh, they need to find themselves somewhere on that map, in the uh, McCarthy's, in the Brick, uh, the Duvey, the McMorrachie, and so on. And there's Ireland post the Norman invasion. So we have the, the Normans landing on May the 1st, 1169. Um, we have the 1170 arrival. And then we have the second and most important 1170 arrival, which is that of Strongbow or William Fitzgilbert de Clare. And Strongbow becomes the uh, guy who, to some extent, invades Ireland. We then have a medieval revival of the Gaelic clans, and you can begin to see some of the modern names appearing. You have the O'Donnells, the McSweeney's, the O'Doherty's, the McQuillan's, the McDonald's, the O'Neill's, the McCartan's, the McGuinness's, the O'Hanlon's, the McMahon's, the Riley's, the Farrell's. So all of these names, which are, are still with us to this day, roughly in the same areas that they were then. Uh, and this is the counties which Ireland is divided into. And the counties are an invention of the Normans. Ireland didn't have counties until the arrival of the Normans, and they used them to uh, identify townland areas. Here we have the re-emergence of the Gaelic order, and that Gaelic resurgence uh, by the 15th century has all of these uh, different tribal areas. So you have the O'Neill of the Fuse, the Great O'Neill, O'Donnell, the O'Cahan, and the O'Neill of Clandy Boy. This is Ireland uh, after the plantations. So we can see that the plantations very much fail in, in most of the south. They only hold on in the Midlands, uh, in a small pocket of, of Wexford, uh, across Limerick and across through North Kerry, but they predominate uh, in what is Ulster with the exception of County Down, which held out uh, longer. This then is um, Ireland under the Williamite ascendancy. So you had um, the arrival of Prince William of Orange in 1690. Then you have the Confederate Wars, and you have the dispatch of the native Irish right into the area of Connacht. And from that, you get Cromwell's famous um, notion of to hell or Connacht. And you can see there are the presentation of uh, Celtic households or Gaelic Catholic households. Connacht, 91%. Munster, 89%. Leinster, 79%. And Ulster with uh, a mere 38%. Then we have the 1798 rebellion. And marked out in red there are the main areas of the uprising, the main centers of activity by the United Men. And then here's the famine years. And you can see, if you look at the percentages, the lowest classes of housing and the lowest areas of literacy are all marked out on that right across the, the country. So into the meat of, uh, of the townlands is Shankill. And as I say, Shankill is a civil parish and that's it represented on a map. And up in the extreme northwest of that map, you can see Ligonil, uh, where you can just make out a wolf. Uh, you can see on the extreme uh, right of it, uh, the townland of Cluck, the Costulia, which we know today as Greencastle. And then the other townlands all radiated around that, down as far as uh, Lower Malone in the south and Upper Malone to the north of that. And that probably bears a bit of explaining because a lot of people, when they when they speak in English, they'll say that they're going up to Dublin, and people are kind of confused by that. Saying, "Well, do you not go down to Dublin?" Well, you don't. You in fact go up to Dublin, and anything that's closer to the sun is up from you, and anything that's further away from the sun is lower. 
So Upper Loch Erin is in the south and Lower Loch Erin is in the north. The same with Upper Belfast. Upper Belfast is in the south and Lower Belfast is in the north. So it's to do with the orientation. It's looking towards the sun as the centre of your world. So what are the townlands of Shankill? We probably are familiar with, with most of them, or at least some of them. And I've highlighted one there, which is Tom of the Tay End. And the reason that I've highlighted that is that there are 60,000 townlands in Ireland. And one of those, Tom of the Tay End, is the smallest townland in all of Ireland. And it's also a mixture of Gaelic and Scots. So a Tay End is literally the toe end. And a Tum is a ceremonial bush. And the townland of Tom of the Tay End sits at the bottom of the Colin River in between the junction of the Stewartstown, or sorry, the Suffolk Road, the Stewartstown Road, and Glen Goland. And it's the smallest townland in all of Ireland. In the civil parish of Shankill, we have 32 townlands. And those 32 townlands are Alt Nagaran. Uh, in English, that's Alt Nagaran. And that means the townland of the Geldings. At Balia Vaston, Waston's town. That townland is obviously at some stage been taken over uh, by planters and, and was called Waston's town. We have Ballybucked, which is just to the east of um, Ballyvaston. And Ballybucked simply means the townland of the poor. We then down in the south of, of, of the parish of Shankle, we have Bally Gulli O, or in English, Bally Cullo. And Bally Gulli O means the townland at the back of the yew trees. Then we have Bally Dunin. Um, at the centre of Bally Dunin is um, the modern day Fallons Club. But up above that, there was the ruins of an ancient uh, iron fort. And that was the, the white fort in question. Ballygoa Marching is Ballygo Martin. And that means the townland of Martin's enclosure. We then have Ballyhanna, which is Hannah's town. And Ballyhanna um, comes from the ancient goddess of sun in Irish, who was Anya. We then have Bally Ward, that should be. Um, we've left out the ward, but Bally Ward is the townland of the sons of the poets. Balia Winyard, and Balia Winyard is the townland of the high thicket. Balia Munya, which um, has the gale top on the Shaw's Road right at its centre. A Balia Munya is the townland of the thicket. Some people argue it may be Balumoni. Um, it's translated in the English as Balamoni, and that could be uh, the townland of the turf. Some of these you really need to have a source to be absolutely positive of what they are. Balyanagaman, the townland of the hurling sticks. Balya Nasalian Aether, uh, Lower Ballysillan, and then just to the south of that, we have Balya Nasalian Uchter. And Ballyan Asalian Uchter is the um, upper at Bally Sillin. And Bally Sillin simply means the townland of the Sally Rods or the townland of the willow trees. Bally Warahoo. Um, and Bally Warahoo stretches really from the Springfield Road right the way down, um, taking in St. James's, taking in Beachmount, taking in uh, the cemetery and taking in parts of what is modern Turf Lodge. Then Bally e Hohen, that's Hohenstown, which is away up in the north west of the parish of Shankle. Uh, Bally Bucked again, uh, mentioned earlier and in by mistake. Bally Vigaroge is Bally Nagari. That again is over in Bally um, Gomartin, right beside it. And that's the townland of Garoge or Garoge's son. And Dewish, which is the Black Mountain. And the Black Mountain, literally in Irish, means Andu Aish, or the Black Ridge. And we have Dor Kilishal, which is the Kilishal, or low wood intake. That's where the lock comes in. We then have Cluck the Costulia. And Cluck the Costulia was a, was a church, uh, which later became known as Green Castle. We have Dunmurray, um, straightforward, Murray's Fort. 
And then we have the one right at the centre of the uh, parish of Shangle, which is Aidan Dura. And Aidan Dura is the area where you would now find the UVF Memorial Garden and the old Shankle Churchyard. And Aidan Dura literally means the brow of the hill of the oak wood. So that would have been a, a sacred site under the pagans. And that then becomes a site of Anshan Kill or the old church. And the old church stood um, just across the road from, from where the modern day St. Matthew's Church stands on the shankle uh, just above the graveyard. Then uh, following on down, we have Anbalia Galda or Balia Nahoglisha. Again, it's one that's disputed. It's translated into English as English's town. And English's town can either be the town of the Uglish, which is the church, or the town of the foreigner. So take your pick of your own land and you're either in the town of the foreigner or in the town of the church lands. Then the one away up in the northeast is Leganale. And Leganale, um, again, it's one that's translated in a number of ways. Leganale, literally in that spell in there, L-A-G-I-N-A-O-I-L, means the hollow of the limestone. But it's also translated as Laganyele. And Laganyele means the townland of the wolf. And the legend is that the last wolf in Belfast uh, was killed there. We don't know. That, that's, that's what they say. We then have Mylun Echter, or Lower Malone. And I've just put in there, it's the Barony of Upper Belfast in the county of Antrim. Most of the others in there, Barony of Lower Belfast. Malone Echter is Upper Malone, which is to the south of uh, Lower Malone. If you follow me, then we have Anshan Park or the old part. Then we have uh, Skyhog and Irla. And Skyhog and Irla is um, literally the thorn bush of the Earl. And the thorn bush of the Earl <coughs> in English is Skeg and Eel. And that comes from the Earl's name, which was O'Neill. So Skeg and Eel is the thorn bush of the O'Neill. I've already mentioned uh, Tom of the Tay End, the smallest townland in all of Ireland, and one of the 32 in the civil parish of Shankle. And then the last one is a, quite a modern townland, and it's Parkin and Walia, which are town parks, and that's just right on the edge of the modern city centre. So a quick look at, at the background, uh, the archaeological background. So we, we have the early Mesolithic period in Ireland, it's from 7,000 to 6,000 BC, and that's followed by the late Mesolithic, 6,000 to 4,000 BC. And it's at this period, 6,000 to 4,000, that we begin to see settlements, which can be lo located by scatters of discarded stone tools. And we find lots of these flints from the Belfast Hills. The earliest upstanding remains or built remains that we have in the hills are from the Neolithic period. And it was during that Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, that's from five and a half thousand years ago to four and a half thousand years ago, that we see the emergence of farming communities across Ireland and across Western Europe. And we also see the collective burial practices uh, breaking in, with, uh, in the form of stone tombs. And those stone tombs are mainly court tombs, portal tombs, passage tombs, and wedge tombs. And there are three examples of those uh, hill in the Belfast Hills. One on the summit of, of Wolf Hill, where there are, are the megalithic remains of the giant's grave. A second uh, burial at Ligonil Quarry, and a tomb which is found in Ballyu Tog, which is just outside the parish of Shangle, uh, beside Hannestown. And that was uh, excavated partially in 1937 and revealed Neolithic pottery, a flint scraper and some Iron Age pottery. And those are the type of tools you're talking about. Those are the early flint tools that, that we find from the hills. The first farmers who developed permanent uh, farmsteads made presence of the flint on the hills. 
and hence the, the evidence. We've also evidence of early quarry sites and, and settlement locations, which are found uh, scattered across the Belfast Hills. The dominant site types uh, associated with this period are ring forts, pseudorains and enclosures. Well, there are numerous examples of early medieval monuments in the Belfast Hills. Uh, many of these date from the early Christian period, which is 400 to 700 AD, or around about 16,000 years ago. And that's the site of the, the giant's grave at Ballyu Tog. You can see that if you drive out from Divis Mountain and head out uh, towards Aldergrove. Um, prior to the National Trust taking over Divis and the Black Mountains, there were only five archaeological sites identified within the boundaries of the hills. And these included two burial cairns. That was Cairn Chinwea, or Yellow Jack's Cairn, uh, where we found a funerary vessel uh, in about 1840, and the remains of a small oval uh, peat-covered basalt cairn, which is located just to the south of the pillar that you see on the top of the modern Black Mountain. Uh, the most significant um, things from these uh, records is the apparent absence of any uh, monuments which are particularly associated with the, the summits of the hills. And when those are the, the, the range of the, the other hills are taken into consideration, it's kind of strange. We, we do uh, believe that a number of them were, were um, bulldozed uh, by the British Army when they occupied the, the summit of the hill. And um, they, they held quite a section of the hills uh, for quite a long time, um, right down until uh, post the Good Friday Agreement. And there's just a wee picture of one of the uh, archaeological digs. And there have been quite a few since then. And um, the, anyone particularly interested in that should visit the site of the Belfast Hills Partnership. So who were the ancient inhabitants of the, the parish of Shankle? Well, the, the most ancient that we can identify are people who are called the Darnie or the Darvini. Uh, in the ancient divisions, uh, south and southwestern parts of the territory were included within the territory of the Dalradii. They're a northern uh, tribe who later became known as the Ulia and the rest were, were designated as, as the Dalriadi. Um, these include the ancient people of Darnarja in Lower County Antrim, and Dalrada, or Dalrada, or Dalrada, of uh, Northern or Upper Antrim and Scotland. There's also a people who are referred to by the ancient name of the Krishna, or modern day, they're described as the Krishna. And there's very little about them in the written record. They're mentioned as... Um, people like St. Congal, for example, was descended from a prince of the Crithen, and the Crithen are, are mentioned in writing in the annals of um, the Four Masters, and they're mentioned alongside the very first mention of Belfast as a settlement, and that's in the year 666, and it simply says, uh, Bellum Firsty, at their Crithen in Ultu, in Kulkethitat Kahasak Maplurnia, and that's the Latin transcription in the thing. It simply means the Battle of Belfast, which was fought between the Ulster men and the Crithen. And all we know from that is that somebody was fighting somebody in Belfast about something 1400 years ago, and we know their names. Um, similarly with Ben Madigan, we know that Ben Madigan's there because the reference to it is uh, Mutadan who was killed in another battle on the height of um, McArch Fort. So townlands themselves are first referred to in written records uh, and the relation to grants made the monasteries. The bala element of it means a home. A shridwala means a, literally a village or a home with a street, and Ballymore becomes a town. But when you refer to place names, the most accurate translation of Balia is the land which belonged to a homestead or a farm. A piece of land big enough to raise uh, enough livestock to feed a family. So in modern Irish, a townland is a Balia Farhan, 
which literally means a home of land. The townland itself becomes the standardized form and it replaces earlier variants and local terms such as a tate, which was a talcha, meaning a territory, or a katrun, which is a quarter or a townland. Town land. And we have katru in the katru Gaeltakta, which is the quarter land of the Gaeltak. A guy called Thomas Larkham uh, was the first person appointed to the Ordnance Survey. And this when you have accurate maps of Belfast being drawn up or of Ireland being drawn up. Uh, and they use uh, the following descriptions to describe individual plots of land. So 10 in English acres is a grieve. Two greaves was one Shashia, which was a, an Irish subdivision. Three Shashia became a tate or a bally bow, literally the town land of a cow. Bally bows became balcha, and that equals one Shashra, a carrow or a plough land. And then four Catherine, which were plough lands, becomes a balya farhan or a balya beta. And a balya beta just means a town of a beast or of, of, of cattle. And then 30 balya farhan or balya betas equals three hundreds of English acres or a barony. So that's that's the way they make them up. And you can see that the, the parish of Shankle and the barony of Shankle has 32 townlands. Uh, and if you believe people in certain parts of West Belfast, it has actually a 33rd one, and that's Spring Hill. But we don't know how accurate that is in, in the historical sense. Uh, you must also remember that when we're talking about townlands, the Irish didn't measure land in a similar way to the English. The Irish looked at land and said, how useful is it? So how big of a piece of land do you need to feed one cow? And that became your tit. So they worked it out on how productive land was, how many uh, bushels of corn you could raise, how many um, stands of wheat, and that's how it was measured. And so the number of cows can be grazed, the amount of pasture land, the time taken to plough arable land, all made up what became known as the Irish acre. And Irish acres differ in size, both in terms of their relation to an English acre and in relation to uh, the size of a townland. So if you have a townland in mountain area, it is much, much bigger than a townland in arable land beside a river. So the usefulness of the land becomes the measure, not, not a distance. And the English um, used the, the measure of distance. So they, they measured everything on the basis of how far it was from the king's nose to the tip of his finger. And they picked one king and stuck with that. So you, you find um, different units of land uh, in different parts of the country, varying from county to county. And townlands are extensively mapped and named in the records under the English uh, plantations, and then later in the aftermath of the 1798 rebellion. So in Fermanagh and Monaghan, for example, they chose the Tate as the measure for a townland, and that gives you comparatively small townlands. In places like Antrim, the Catherine or the Ploughland was, was chosen, and that gave you bigger townland units. Uh, small townlands contain boggy area or mountain area. Uh, in areas of Norman settlement, the townland boundaries will follow field and property boundaries or the boundaries of commonage. And in Norman settled areas, townlands were usually had irregular borders and were of smaller size. So one of, one of the, the most famous that we can pin down is um, Nocnagoni in East Belfast. And Nocnagoni means crook. Nagunini or the Hill of the Rabbits. And we know that that's Norman because it's the Normans who bring rabbits to Ireland. Uh, townlands in traditional Gaelic areas are larger in area and they usually have more irregular boundaries, which are always fixed by streams, rivers, and roads. It's very rare that that, that um, changes. And that's why you have the Irish custom when you're crossing a stream by a bridge, you drop money in because you're given tribute as you go into another area or in the another tribal area and then that develops into offerings to the fairies and the goblins and the gods and here we have him uh, robert banks jenkinson the second earl of liverpool as they called him 
He was the British Prime Minister, and he uh, is the guy who authorises the first total survey of Ireland using a scale of six inches to one mile. And the survey was to map out all the townlands, their boundaries, and to fix them for one purpose, raising taxation. So the guy put in charge of it is Thomas Colby, a lieutenant colonel. And under his command are a series of British Royal Engineers and three companies of sappers and miners. And the survey started from a baseline, which was established at Ballykelly in Derry. The survey itself uh, starts under the main surveyor, Thomas Drummond. And Thomas Drummond was on Devis Mountain and he spent three months trying to spot Schlieve Schnacht on the Anishowan Peninsula, but he found that the, the rain and poor visibility made it almost impossible. But he was also experimenting with calcium oxide, which becomes known as quicklang. And he worked out that this could be so, seen over great distances as long as you had line of sight. So he, he put that into practice and he established line of sight between the top of Devis Mountain and the top of Sleeve Snap. This then becomes known as line light, and that's used for lighting up stages in uh, the ancient theatre. And there you get the, the um, origin of the saying, seeking the limelight, trying to get into the limelight, trying to get on the stage, putting yourself at the centre. And these are the two guys that, that carried out the um, translation of all the townlands. So between 1825 and 1830, we get Richard Griffith's delimitation of townlands and parish boundaries, according to the map. And then in 1830, they established valuations so as to bring in an equal tax system, which is what they said. Basically what they meant was they wanted to tax everybody. And so you get a, a document, a, a series of documents, which are known as Griffith's valuations. And they're useful for anybody looking up family uh, names. In 1830, the townlands were standardized, and that work was carried out by these two guys. Uh, the Dr. Sean O'Donovan, or John Donovan, who was the professor of Celtic studies at Queen's, and he was assisted by Owen O'Curry, or Eugene Curry, from County Clare. And O'Donovan went to great extremes to get the place names right, but he, expl he explained that he had a lot of difficulty uh, and his quote was, it was hard to get the people to talk, and when they were plied with liquor, they couldn't be stopped. So it's pretty like getting under the, the laurel leaf to dance in, what he called that street across the road, and you'll get as many versions as you buy the muskies. So he, he found that it was the same back in the 1830s. O'Donovan also, before he reached any conclusion about a town land name, considered the Latin and the French languages as well as the Gaelic language to establish origins. And we owe them a great debt in, in one way because these guys mapped out the entirety of Ireland's townland divisions. And these are townlands that go right back in the antiquity. But what they do is they give us a lot of information about where we live and where we are from. You can look at a townland in English. And basically what O'Donovan did was he would take the Irish, he would take the meaning, and then he would translate it into English. So basically, um, the most unionist loyalist area in Belfast is the Shankle, and that literally means Anshan Kill, or the old church. You get some nice ones that pop up, like for example, when they were surveying Armagh, <coughs> they were asking for directions as they made their way to Armagh, and O'Donovan and Curry were Gaelic speakers, and the British soldiers with them were taking notes, <clears throat> and one of them asked a local how they got to Armagh, and he said, Chen to an Arja er Krokenshin, Guji Gumain Ton Regiogat, I was near a Taton Regiogat, Shinni Ardmaha he shoot. And the Brit asked them what they were saying, and he said, He's saying that we go to the top of the hill, and then that's Armagh below us. And the Brit said, But he said, he said a name, Ton Regi, and he says, Yes, Ton Regi. And he asked them to spell that. And Tonrigi, which is the modern day Tonrigi, literally means your arse to the wind. And on that note, enjoy your townlands. 
and enjoy the talk. Cor Amelia Mogul.